Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I, I doubt I'm going to get any kind of advanced degrees till the university figures out how to give a dishonorable degree, at which point uh, they'll be standing in line outside my door. Uh, all right. Values promotion in American foreign policy over the last 200 years. Maybe because I don't have much of an education, a formal education, I have spent some time thinking about things in ways I wouldn't call them so much um, sort of interdisciplinary as non-disciplinary. Um, I don't tend to think in terms of rigid boxes of history and political science. In fact, when I'm in a room full of, of political scientists, everyone looks at me as some kind of you know, horrible historian who, who objects to great law, historical laws of development and, 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 and doesn't really take a lot of interest in empirical evidence and uh, all of that stuff showing I'd, uh, the sort of I'd commonalities between different situations. And when I'm in a group of historians, they all think I'm a horrible popularizer, so interested in making big sweeping generalizations that I have no feel for the granularity of history. But I actually think there is an important intellectual space between history and political science. That is to say, a good professional historian fundamentally doesn't think history is useful in the sense that what, what a good professional historian really wants to do is get the granularity and the uniqueness of each historical instance and is more interested in what makes this historical moment or incident different from all others than in any possible connection. And a good political scientist is looking for big grand connections that you can do statistical regressions and identify all kinds of correlations with. Uh, but there's something in the middle that, that is interested in, history, interested in acquiring as, as detailed a knowledge as possible of different historical moments, events, movements, but is interested in using that better to understand the present and think about the present. And that's the space that perhaps somewhat inconsequentially and ineffectively that I attempt to occupy. And when I turn that lens onto, human, uh, onto the study of the promotion of values and human rights in American foreign policy, I find it, it sort of leads me to three big points that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, my father, by the way, is an Episcopal priest, and when I was going to do a lot of public speaking, Dad, uh, when, he, when he knew that was going to happen, Dad gave me a warning. He said, first of all, he says, no one will ever understand more than three points. Never make more than three points in a talk because it's useless. Uh, then he also gave me another piece of advice, which is that when you're, when you're giving a talk, no matter how exciting the talk is, how important it is to your audience, you'll find at a certain point that people begin to lose their focus. Uh, they start kind of, you, you can look in their eyes and see them beginning to drift away. He says there is one infallible surefire method to regain their attention at that point. He says, you just look around the room and start saying things like, finally, and in conclusion, <laughs> and you have them all back again. So those are, those are, that, that's what I have instead of a graduate degree, is advice from my preacher father. Anyway, the, th the first of the three big points that I see, or at least think I see, when I look at uh, history, uh, th this history, is I see that, in fact, the promotion of values has always been an important part of American foreign policy. Um, there are certainly ups and downs in political fashion and all of these things, but you really cannot find long periods in American history where this isn't in some way an integral part of our foreign policy process. And I think there are a couple of big reasons for it. One of them people are, are aware of and talk about as if it were the only reason, and that is that American political culture is moral, or as some would say, moralistic. 
Uh, and some say, well, that's an aspect of the sort of Puritan or early Protestant um, cultural foundations of American life. But I actually think there, there's something that makes it more durable than that, which is that our, um, our political system is shaped by an ideology that, that, that says something very powerful about the equality and dignity of all human beings. Our democratic politics at home rests on some assumptions, beliefs about human nature and about the way people ought to behave to one another and about the way institutions ought to behave uh, toward the citizens of a country. And by its nature, these beliefs cannot be limited simply to Americans. That is, if you really believe that all people are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, it's, it's actually very hard to believe, and those by, by people we mean all people, we mean all citizens of the United States of America. There is a, our, there is a sense in which the legitimacy of our domestic institutions rests on a set of ideas about what the world society should be like, what all human beings should live. So there's a sense in which we can't get away from this even if we decided we wanted. We can't ignore the fundamental philosophical beliefs that shape our, our foreign policy without also giving up on things that make our domestic politics what they are. I think that's been true for 200 years. I think it's likely to remain true for a long time to come. But beyond that, there's a sense in which America in the world is a revolutionary nation, not so much because we've woken up and decided our moral values compel us to be the avatars and leaders of a global transformation, but this is because the way our society works is profoundly destabilizing to the rest of the world. Now, sometimes I tell my students that, that when Al Gore invented the internet, he did as much to destabilize the Middle East as George Bush did when he invaded Iraq. That is, no one in America was thinking about oh, let's flatten hierarchies, let's challenge the social status quo everywhere in the world. Simply, you know, they were thinking, how can we communicate with that, you know, more effectively? How can we get email out? How can my company have a, have a corporate website? All of these kinds of things. But the result of the internet was a profoundly, revolutionary force in politics all over the world and poses huge problems for all kinds of governments and cultures whose foundations are different from our own. In the same way, Hollywood movies have changed cultures, have all over the world, they create a situation where young people no longer think necessarily hey, I should marry the people that my, my person that my parents tell me to marry because, gosh, I've been watching this movie and the heroine there sure didn't listen to her father and it worked out kind of well and she's really attractive and so is the guy she married. There are all kinds of ways in which the American presence in the world is subversive. In the 19th century, we were seen, as Bob Kagan may remind us later today, as a dangerous nation. We weren't sending armies out into the world to overthrow other regimes, but the existence of a successful, stable, large, powerful, economically effective democratic society was a terrible example from the standpoint of all the rulers and religious traditionalists and others in Europe who, who, who wanted to argue that, that their particular hierarchical positions were necessary to the effective governance of society as a whole. My privilege is not a special privilege. It's simply without a hereditary monarchy, society collapses into anarchy and chaos. 
So my power is your security. The United States of America was just giving one big raspberry to all of these statements that were foundational to the political legitimacy of governments overseas. And inevitably, by the way, the friends of stability and authority in countries around the world tended to be anti-American. While forces who wanted to see social change in their countries were pro-American. It's something that we can still see to get today. This is, you know, this again, the United States is revolutionary by being as well as by acting. And a foreign policy that doesn't take this into account is going to run into trouble because it is ignore, it's not being realist, it is ignoring reality. You can see this very concretely today in the way that you have companies like Google and other major Silicon Valley companies whose business models depend on a certain kind of open internet that relies on things like freedom of information, freedom of assembly, freedom of communication. And so a company like Google will see, say, the, the boundaries of Chinese or Iranian or Russian power are the boundaries that limit where its business model can reach. So that for commercial reasons, much of American commerce is pushing the government toward, pushing our government toward the promotion of internet governance or freedom of communications and so on in ways that, that in fact are parallel to and in, in some cases exactly ex equivalent to value, what you would call values or rights promoting foreign policy. It's also true a country like ours which has global trading interests. We have investors around, we have, we have American students around the world, we have companies engaging in contracts. We want, it's important to the American government, it can't help but be important to the American government that freedom, that, that contracts be enforceable in transparent and honest courts of law in other countries. So all kinds of people who don't think of themselves as democratic reformers in the history of American foreign policy have been pushing rather consistently all kinds of reform agendas in the world, and that's, and that's well over 200 years old. It is going to increase. So it is, it, people who think you can have American foreign policy that is not rooted in values promotion of some kind which doesn't have this as an important aspect of what we do, simply don't understand how American foreign policy historically has worked and currently does work. So that's the first point it seems to me that one gets from looking at the history of American foreign policy and, and asking yourself, what does it teach us about today? But, The second thing that I think we learn from, from the study of democracy over the last 200 years is that transitions to democracy are really hard and they usually fail in the short term, often in the very long term. Naive, happy, clappy enthusiasm about oh, it's a revolution overseas, they're twittering, it's going to be fantastic, all right? The first prominent historical victim of this delusional politics was Thomas Jefferson, who looked at the French Revolution and said, what could go wrong? Nothing, all right? It happened again with the Latin American revolutions, all kinds of Americans thought, Oh, it's fantastic. Democracy in Bolivia, how could it possibly fail? What could go wrong? 
The answer was, in many countries, 50 years and more of bad governance, chaos, anarchy, repeated dictatorships. It was terrible. We saw it again, 1848, it's happening. No, it wasn't. 1918, Weimar Republic, democracy in Germany. <laughs> okay, If we think about it, France had its first democratic revolutionary movement in 1789. It's really not until 1871 or two that you get a long-term stable, quasi-stable, democratic republic in France. All right. Now you proceed, you know, you had sort of ups and downs in those 90-year intervals. The transition in Germany was longer and even more destructive. Right? The transition in Russia continues. Egypt has frankly been trying to modernize since Napoleon got there in 1798. And in many ways, as far as I can tell, it's further behind France now than it was in 1798 when the Egyptian elite first said to themselves, we've really got to change. What we're doing is not working. So, and yet all kinds of people in what likes to call itself the democracy promotion movement fail to pay any attention whatever to all of this stuff. Just let, just let a couple of English speaking liberals tweet and we get all soft and fuzzy and excited and, oh, it's happening, it's happening. It probably isn't. And something much uglier probably is happening. Not always, because in fact, there are more democracies now than there were in 1789. To say that the path of democratization is not smooth or simple is not to immediately go to despair and say there's no possibility. Oh, it's all useless. History proves nothing happens, nothing changes. No. But the road is difficult. It is complicated. It is long. This would suggest that advocates of democracy and, and democracy promotion need perhaps to spend less time looking at technocratic measures of democracy. And I know I'm saying this at Freedom House, where, which really has developed some of the best technocratic measure, measures around. They really have, okay? But they're not that good necessarily as predictors because the historical process of the development of democracy is a complicated, tumultuous, deep, and it does not always go the same way from one country to the next. And it's also very difficult to measure what is a democracy. Uh, frankly, if, if, the, if, if Germany of 1913, Wilhelmine Germany were around today, we would probably be calling it an emerging democracy and maybe toward, uh, you know, sort of toward the higher end of emerging democracies. There's a parliament, there's freedom of the press on virtually every subject, there's, there's real open debate over public policy, there's academic freedom. Um, this, to my mind, is one of the reasons democratic peace theory has never worked very well for me, uh, is that you have to define democracy very, very carefully so that this works. Um, and again, by today's standards, Wilhelmine Germany was really not that bad of a, demo of a democracy. It's not total. Um, and the process by which it got from there to here is not, was not smooth or unidirectional, to say the least. So. What are the reasons that this democracy promotion is, or demo democratization is so much more complicated? Why are democracy advocates fooled over and over into thinking this is going to be much easier? Why do they lose credibility with the public and often become an object of widespread mockery because they fail to take hold 
of the complexities. And they run around for three years spending untold billions of dollars, well, hundreds of millions, on a transition to democracy in Egypt that was never happening. Why? What are some of the complexities that, that people often miss? Well, first, I think one of them that Frank pointed to this morning was, was capacity. State capacity is very important. And I was in Ukraine in, in 2000, around, about a, oh, nine months after the Orange Revolution. The American embassy was full of people who were sure that light had dawned. It was like listening to Thomas Jefferson talk about um, France in 1789. The same naivete, uh, the same blindness to the complexity that was coming, the same lack of grip about the utter state failure that was staring Ukraine in the face even then. Um, more than that, than, than, state, than the state capacity issue. There's some other issues. There's cultural and historical legacies and beliefs. In many places, cultures have popular beliefs about how the world works that are not compatible with effective economic management. The word Argentina, for some reason, is floating in my mind. Um, where a Democrat, democratic processes over and over again will produce governments that make terrible economic decisions as a result of which the society falls into a deep social crisis which democratic, force, or democratic institutions and parties cannot cope with very well. Right? This is not so much an issue of state capacity. It's that the people vote in democratic elections for parties who then go screw everything up so often that, uh, that sometimes the, you know, by, by the, the support for democracy collapses to the point where things like a coup are popular at least for a little while. And Argentina is not alone in, in that happy uh, category. Um, you have many places where Ideas about what the state is and how it works are connected to feudalism because that's the history of society, of a kind of an elite of birth and aristocracy that run things. And it's, it's this idea that, that the state is a kind of a property. You know, think of feudalism where you become the Duke of Normandy, and that means you get to have all the revenues of the dukedom, uh, but what you owe is then political allegiance and support up to the king and you distribute the goodies of your dukedom to your followers who would, again, get to enjoy goodies on their own but then are obliged to support you. That's actually not very different from Russia today. But in many, you know, in many ways what you have is people who, who feel that, this is a pro that, that what we think of as corruption feels like, looks like politics to people. And this is a cultural reality that, that comes out of the historical experience of a people. It's not, in the long term, conducive to better governance or modernization, but it's real. It's a force. And it, you can't, it doesn't just go away because somebody pu publishes a white paper saying it's a bad idea. And it's very hard to develop laws that can block this kind of corruption or institutions that can monitor it when psychologically many of the people charged with enforcing these laws and monitoring themselves also believe that corruption and politics are not as different as some of these Westerners or others may think. So people, you know, th there are also sort of legacies of social inequality in many countries in the world, you have a legacy from colonialism and independence struggles where it was only when a nation produced an authoritarian political party with a charismatic leader that you were able to kick the foreigners out and have any power at all yourselves. And so there's a legitimacy and an emotional tie to the party that set you free. 
and you don't, you know, legalistic norms and so on, the colonizers would still be here if you had done things that way. And these, like, these historical cultural loyalties, again, they're not necessarily the products of rational reflection, and they don't go away just because somebody, a talking head says on television that, that this is inappropriate. It's a long process of change. And during all of that time, a society will not necessarily work the you know, democratic institutions or formal institutions won't work the way they ought to work because the people charged with carrying these functions out are carrying them out with a different understanding of what politics is, what legitimacy is, how things work. And you're not a team of American political consultants is not going to change this in what we would call a policy relevant time frame in many, many cases. And there are also beliefs about the world. You know, there are places where people have very strong religious beliefs about how the world should work. And if you have a democratic government, they again may, may vote for uh, people who have ideas about, about the economy or the place of women or other things that, that are not really compatible with effective governance in modern conditions. So democracy and good government are not always the same. Don't, democracy doesn't always lead to effective government. And we like to think, okay, well, they elect the wrong people. Then they, observe, then they regret that they elected the wrong people because they see the policies don't work. And then they elect you know, the better people. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they say, well, we just, you know, the people we voted for, uh, you know, Hindenburg is a nice, great conservative German nationalist, but he's not conservative enough. He's not German nationalist enough. We need the guy who'll give us the real stuff, that Adolf guy. Um, it is not the case that, that, you know, again, nations walk a narrow path. It's easy to fall off into extremes of various kinds and to fall into the hands of parties and movements that are anti-democratic and effective at being so. And the again, just look at the historical path. Very few countries walk a smooth path to democracy. There is also a deeper issue. And that issue is we in the United, you know, in America, we are really the land of historical optimists and determinists. We believe history is moving up. Well, Frank says it's over. Uh, and actually, I, I tend to agree with Frank with all, you know, those lovely complicated nuances that mean that we can stay up late at night arguing. But basically, I, I, th I think so. But it's a much more complicated process. I can't help but remember the first person who said that history was over was Hegel, and that was at the Battle of Jena in 1807. History is over. Napoleon has defeated the Prussians. The principles of the French Revolution have triumphed over feudalism. Hegel said what will be left is disturbances in the provinces, you know, like China, Russia, and of course later Germany. In any case, the fact that in some way history is heading on a certain trajectory, we think and believe, doesn't mean that the path is smooth or that the causalities all work together. You know, if you look at sort of Eastern Central Europe and the Middle East as a whole, you go back to 1850 and there are, you know, 1870, let's say, there may be like five or six states in this region. The Ottoman Empire, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the New German Empire, then like, you know, Greece and a couple of other tiny things. Well, today, there are like 50 or 60 states there. And by the way, in, in, you know, none of those states were democracies in 1870. Today, there are like 50 or 60 states, maybe 30 or 40 are, 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 are democracies. And to produce that, it required the death of about 150 million people in two major world wars untold episodes of ethnic cleansing and genocide, of which the Holocaust was simply the largest and the most dramatic. But slaughter, you know, there are, all, there are all these now ethnically homogenous, happy democratic states in 
Central Europe that are that way in part because one way or another they somehow got rid of all of those pesky minorities that were making everyone so unhappy. Um, and so you've had, you know, you've had ethnic cleansing of millions of Germans from Poland and the Czech Republic. You've had massive ethnic cleansing of Greeks being driven to, out of Turkey and Turks and Muslims being driven out of Greece. The other, I think something like 5% of everyone in Turkey today is basically descended of, from somebody who was forced out as the Ottoman Empire shrank and there was all kinds of religious and ethnic violence associated with that. The, and, and very often, the, we, we like to think, okay, modernization to democracy to stable democratic peace, a nice train of thought. In fact, if you look at what actually happens, it often turns out that democracy is associated with the rise, of, the rise of democracy and the rise of profound ethnic tension are related. Uh, think about American history where Jacksonian democracy was partly about getting rid of the Indians, driving the Indians away out of, out of the land so that the democratic people could own their own land. Think about in, Germany, in Austria where a lot of the more democratic parties like that mayor in Vienna were the anti-Semites, anti often was the aristocrats who didn't want all that nasty anti-Semitism. They didn't like Jews, but they didn't like all this like vulgar spouting about it and having mobs in the street. Um, democratic movements were often, it was kind of, okay, all we Czechs should stick together. We Czechs should have the right of self-determination. Czech, you know, Czechia for the Czechs. Um, and rich Czechs should take care of poor Czechs and all Czechs are brothers, of course, you know, not so much the Germans, not so much the Gypsies, not so much the Jews. And by saying this, I don't mean to blame the Czechs, who actually have had one of the nicer evolutions. But the rise of democracy and the rise of ethnic tension, hatred, and violence historically are often connected. And in many cases, you know, you, I mean, we, we see in Egypt the vote for the Muslim Brotherhood was not necessarily a vote for a happy life for the cops in Egypt. Um, this is not new. This is not some surprising distortion. And yet over and over and over again, democracy proponents are surprised by things that repeatedly happen. And it suggests that we are not deep enough in our thinking. We underestimate the profound importance of democracy promotion, but also its difficulty. It's a deep, it, 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 thinking about how you get there. You think about in Africa, uh, it's likely that in many, many countries, tribal and religious tensions and identities will become important as economic development moves, as it increases the role of the state. People find it more important that the state be run by people who think like them, speak like them, uh, are operating it in their interests. So we are likely to see, continue to see, uh, a link between the rise of democracy and the rise of various forms of social conflict and tension within countries. Well, the third big point that I want to make, and I'll make it quickly because I've been pointing to it all along, that is that democracy proponents really do need to become better historians. We really do need to understand, for example, you know, the, we need to know the history of human rights, the history of past enthusiasms that went awry, which movements succeed, which movements fail, which movements succeed but then profoundly disappoint. What is, we need to think more deeply too, what is democracy? What are its sources? How does it relate to other values? 
Um, and we probably need to accept that in many countries around the world, democracy promotion may be less a question of enabling some, a handful of civil society organizations to be more effective activists, and is much more about nurturing and promoting a profound and long-term process of social reflection, change, development, and enrichment. Um, so those are just some thoughts, some of them perhaps consoling to the community, some of them perhaps a bit more challenging, but that's at least what one completely unqualified person thinks he's learned from a long period of unsystematic study. Thank you very much. All right. Well, it turns out we have a few minutes of Q&A. Charles, do you want to? Uh, seven all right. All right. OK, and I'll just remind people that a question is typically a short statement that would be punctuated by a question mark, <laughs> in case anybody is unsure what that would be. Yes? Oh, we have a uh, microphone. Oh, gotcha. Professor Mead, so uh, how would you explain the democratic transition of Japan after 1945, uh, given that Japan had a very different tradition than most of the Western democracies at the time? I think if you, you know, if you look at how many Japanese the Americans killed in, 19, in 1945, specifically, forget the, forget the um, atom bombs for a moment. But between March and August of 1945, the United States killed roughly 900,000 civilians in Japan, most of them through a process of bombs aimed at deliberately at civilian populations. Um, I think in one night, firebombing using incendiary bombs dropped on residential districts in Tokyo. Uh, killed about 85,000 Japanese civilians. Of course, the count is not exact. Um, and this, um, this was more than the total number of U.S. military deaths in the Korean, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghan wars combined uh, one night. So the Japanese in 1945 were at a point where they were really ready to listen to what Douglas MacArthur had to say, okay? And so I think, um, you know, if we're prepared to do that again, there might be some places where we could also get some democracy going. But I would argue that's not, that, that is not our preferred strategy. Yes, ma'am. Up here, in the, the lady in the front. Diana Negroponte from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Professor Mead, would you address the correlation between economic recession and the rise of undemocratic forces? Well, I mean, it often, there often is a connection. Um, uh, and, you know, the, the sort of best one is the rise of Adolf Hitler, or the most striking one, I should say, not the best. Um, you know, and it is certainly, I, I would say more generally, social stress often leads to authoritarian regime, and that can be economic. But you can also have things like a perceived unfair treaty or massive unwanted cultural change or other kinds of, there, there are lots of, of uh, stress generally tends to push societies toward more extreme forms. However, it's also true that stress can be the trigger, including economic stress, of economic, uh, of, of, of a democratic shift. In other words, any status quo that fails to produce prosperity can come under stress, and people who would normally not be listened to may be listened to more. So democratic reformers can also use the, the economic failure of an existing regime as a way of getting credibility for what they want to do. But unfortunately, in spite of all these ec economists who keep telling us that economics is a science and we know the answers, <laughs> economists keep disagreeing profoundly with each other about how to achieve permanent prosperity, permanent stable prosperity. So I think we have to accept that 
we are going to continue to see threats to stability by unexpected economic developments, maybe long into the future. Uh, in the back there. Thank you. Uh, Michael Allen with the National Endowment for Democracy and the Democracy Digest blog. Um, I don't want to appear overly defensive from an institutional point of view, but I must take uh, issue I with your... I had no institutions <laughs> or sure. people in mind. I really didn't. No, but your characterization or the caricature of the democracy promotion community or democracy proponents is one, frankly, I, I simply don't recognize. Um, firstly, in terms of transitions versus consolidation, by most estimates, the most serious research, vastly superior resources are spent on consolidation and institutional development rather than on fomenting so-called regime change. Um, and with respect to your reference to Egypt, I know of nobody within the democracy assistance community who had any, who had any illusions about that transition, as opposed to the media, for example, who elevated the Facebook slacktivists to kind of mythical sainthood statement. And at the reference to hundreds of millions of uh, dollars being spent, let me remind you that the NGO activists from NDI, RI, Freedom House, et, et cetera, were imprisoned over a mere $60 million of democracy assistance. The only actors I know who spent hundreds of millions of dollars uh, with respect to that transition were the Gulf monarchies and the Islamist charities who were supporting illiberal and anti-democratic mm -hmm. actors. And as regards to the question, would you care to comment? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad there was a question in there somewhere, <laughs> but it was a pretty questionable speech, so I was giving it room. Um, well, all I can say is that in terms of correlation, as we've been hearing, all the Freedom House indices are going backward, and yet we've seen actually probably a greater U.S. government commitment uh, to pushing those indices forward. So there's not necessarily a good correlation between effort and output. Now, there might be lots of reasons for that, and I'm not trying to argue some sort of simplistic thing, but I am suggesting that, in fact, there never was much chance for a genuinely democratic transition in Egypt. And, uh, you know, the demo you, you did not hear the democracy promotion community taking the lead and saying, you know, actually, maybe democracy promotion, we shouldn't be spending a lot of time on Egypt because it's not going to happen or we should be looking at longer term strategies. Um, it was, uh, there, there was, people were willing to ride with it while it looked like it was going somewhere. So I'm, again, I am not here to try to say that uh, we should defund and this is, you know, all of these kinds, that's not my point. My point is that democracy promotion is so important to American foreign policy that we need to do it better. And that we, if we're not willing to admit that we have not always done it that well, that's, a, that's an incredibly fatalistic view. We've all done a great job and the fact that democracy is not progressing is inevitable. And then certainly not, there's nothing we could have done differently or better to change that. If that's our point of view, that's actually making a rather stronger argument for defunding all these efforts than I would want to make. I, that they're, not, they're, they're not working very well and all the people involved say there's nothing they could do that would be better. So I think we need to think about change and improvement because frankly it isn't going well. All right, I think maybe on that note I will uh, step down.